So thanks, Thomas, for joining us. Um, just to put some things in context, this empty chair isn't here as a symbolic gesture as to where the other candidates are. <laughs> It's just an empty chair preparing for the three critics from the other parties, okay? Um, we're not, it's not a political statement. But, but having said that, where are your colleagues tonight? <laughs> Can I gotta tell you, I, I'm a little embarrassed because uh, I was looking forward to this uh, in, a, in a debate format. Uh, for those of you who have been reading or will be reading the media tomorrow, you will find that uh, I have been calling for a public debate. You know, this may be a leadership of a political party, but at the end of the day, we're choosing a premier for this province, and we know what profound influence uh, premiers have over policy, over ministers, over direction of our province. And uh, it would have been nice to be able to publicly, openly debate uh, issues that really matter, particularly education. But you know what? We'll make the best of it, and uh, you'll have to take it from there. Okay. Thomas, we have four themes that we want to talk about, and questions around those themes, and looking for your reaction. This is not a it won't be a formally structured conversation, it'll be more of a conversation. But it's important to ATA members that they get insights from you on these four themes uh, and other ones. We can, we can digress, but I really do want to cover these four themes on. And they are educational transformation, public education funding, the profession itself, the teaching profession, and then some non-educational issues. Uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy those ones as much as you the first three. <laughs> So we've got 45 minutes, and I have an opportunity here. Um, it's your floor. Uh, you've got two or three minutes to open, open your remarks. Tell us a bit about yourself. Why did you decide to run for leader, and why are you in this game? Well, thank you. Well, it's really your floor, and uh, I, I hope that Ken gets to answer, ask as many questions as he possibly can on your behalf. Uh, because as I said earlier, this is a, a very important race. You know what? One of the rare opportunities that running for a leadership of a political party uh, affords you uh, is the opportunity to actually be yourself. Uh, when you run for office, uh, for an elected office uh, in provincial or federal politics, you, you usually run under a banner of a political party, under a certain leader, and, and there are parameters set for you. When you're running for a leadership of that party, you're painting on a blank canvas. Uh, so what I find particularly particularly uh, rewarding is that for the first time in my uh, some 14 year polit political career, I get to be Thomas, I get to be myself, and I get to paint the picture of tomorrow in Alberta the way I would like to see it, the way I think Albertans would like to see it, and, uh, and I hope that you have the opportunity to share some of that uh, with you. No, we have a great province, uh, envy of, of many jurisdictions. We know we have one of the best education systems in the world. Uh, but there is a lot of room for improvement uh, on the social side, and, and I've always been very passionate about that. Uh, if we are to grow our economy, if we are to finally not just talk about it, but diversify our economy, imagine if Alberta became a food producer for the rest of the world. Uh, we, can, we don't have to only energize this world, we can feed this world. Frankly, we can heal this world. We could be a, a superpower in research and innovation. In order for that to happen, we have to build a province that actually attracts people. We have to build a province in which our kids will want to stay. We have to build a province that we are proud of calling home. Because at the end of the day, we are building a home for many, many generations to come. This is not a work camp where people come, work for four or five years, make a lot of money and try to leave as fast as possible. But that means that we have to make some very purposeful decisions over the next uh, few years. And, um, and I have a vision that, uh, that, I, that I find uh, would get us there. Uh, and I'm hoping to be able to share some of that with you. And predominantly, uh, as we know, obviously education is at the very center of it. And uh, when I was a Minister of Education, uh, we had what I consider to be a, a good relationship. We talked. Uh, we visited each other. Uh, we were focusing on inspiring education. We were focused on the most important part, the classroom. Because that's where it all happens, that's what it's all about. And I'll be the first one to tell you, uh, this relationship that I have been observing from, from outside over the last year or so is not the kind of relationship I would allow to happen under my leadership. Uh, at the end of the day, education consists of, yes, the Department of Education and some of the research and leadership that they are supposed to bring forward, parents who are uh, stakeholders in the system and provide us with very valuable feedback, but also you, the teachers, the professionals who are in the classrooms every day. 
If you try to develop policies and if you want to move forward with the system, not including one of the three parties, good odds are you're going to be misguided. That's the kind of a relationship we have. And that's the kind of a relationship I would like to reconstruct in a hurry because we've, we've wasted a lot of time. And uh, that is a time that we can't afford to waste any further. Our kids' education and their future is at stake. You've given me a good segue here into the, uh, the first topic area of educational transformation. Uh, Erin is a grade six teacher from Grand Prairie and her question is, inspiring education is supposed to be all about more individualized instruction for students and more flexibility in programming. And I'm not sure how this vision for the 21st century education works with standardized tests. We may have gotten rid of the PATs, but we still have a standardized exam that is used for accountability and will be reported on by the Fraser Report. And the minister is saying he wants them every year. What role do you think standardized testing should have in schools? Well, uh, the minister of the day will have to reconsider that uh, very quickly uh, if I am so fortunate to be, uh, to be the premier. Uh, as you know, uh, and, and you may recall, I had some epic battles with the Fraser Institute. Uh, what I found is that using PAT scores uh, to grade schools uh, is simply the wrong thing to do. And I always felt so bad for parents who chose to make decisions based on their, their kids' education, based on a Fraser, the Fraser Institute uh, report. And in the media, I always use the example, you know, you may have a neighborhood where majority of the children uh, arrive, they're refugees, English is their, their second language, their parents actually may be illiterate in their, in their first language. Um, and, and they require a great deal of effort and integration, classroom management. And if you see these children progress, uh, move up just a little, that is more important and that requires more work and, and more focus from the teacher than in another neighborhood where perhaps the children show up already fully, uh, uh, fully engaged and, and with, with, uh, with the re with literacy and numeracy skills uh, before they even arrive in school. So comparing schools to schools is simply unfair, it's inappropriate, and has been leading to some very poor decisions um, uh, in the past. First of all, I want to share with you that I, I've always seen an issue with the grade 12 diploma exam. 50-50 um, is simply not the way to go. I, I would be a hypocrite if I told you that I know what the number should be while I just told you that we need to talk and we need to make decisions together. The number I have in mind, and let, that would be a good starting point for our conversation, is somewhere around 70-30, uh, and let's take it from there. But the fact is that I put much more credence uh, in teachers' individualized assessment of a student's progress uh, than simply one snippet in time uh, on, a, on a PAT exam. If we were to carry on with PAT exams, I would want to see them administered at the beginning of a school year and not at the end of a school year. Uh, perhaps that could serve as a tool to a teacher to assess uh, where they're at and, and what their new cohort of teachers, uh, students, um, uh, where, they're, where they're faring at. But at the end of the day, those tests were simply misused uh, by third parties and were not serving the purpose that they were intended for. Inspiring education. Mm -hmm. A lot of work's been done on that. A lot of expectations. Good report. Well received, generally speaking. What elements of inspiring education do you think should be maintained and which ones should be reviewed? You know, overall, this was a phenomenal report. And, and if we really used up the energy that we uh, expended over the last year on this acrimonious relationship and put that energy into implementing inspiring education. Just imagine where we would be right now. I definitely would want to I definitely would want to dust up that report as, as early as possible. Uh, look at it uh, from today's perspective. Has anything changed? Uh, do we still support uh, the content of it? And, and put a lot of muscle behind implementing it. You know, that report took a lot of work. Um, many, many Albertans educators and others uh, were involved in creating of this report. It would be a shame uh, if we left it somewhere in the ministry on a shelf collecting dust any further. So I will not speculate what stays, what goes out, because again, 
that is not how we're going to make decisions. We will sit down and figure out what stays in, what goes out. But one thing that will happen is we will start working on it. The teaching profession and educational funding, some other topics. Let's talk about funding for a few minutes. Instable educational funding over the past few years has resulted in teacher positions being cut, larger class sizes, reduced supports for special needs students. How will the government under your leadership ensure stable, predictable, and adequate funding for schools? How will you provide that? Ken, you know, that's, a, that's an issue that, that all politicians in, in this province have and, and will continue to struggle uh, into the future with. Uh, because of the fact that the revenue, revenue that this province currently has is, is so unstable. And some will say, well, change the taxation regime and, and that will equalize. Well, that's frankly not the case because the base off of which you calculate taxes is, is, very, is very unstable. It's, a, it's, a, it's very cyclical. And, and when the price of oil in this province drops, not only royalties drop, but the income tax drops and the corporate income mm -hmm. tax drops and everything. And, and the revenues drop. So if there is any candidate out there, it doesn't matter from what political party, whether it's PC or opposition, and they assure you that they will give you predictable, sustainable funding for so many years into the future, uh, they must have a crystal ball uh, that, that I don't. The fact is that we together as Albertans must really focus on diversifying our economy, generating new revenue streams uh, into this province so that we are not so singularly dependent on one commodity. Having said that, with the situation that we have right now, uh, obviously education, healthcare, and advanced education are the three departments uh, that, that have to have a priority. So what I have already indicated and met with uh, both of the, uh, with the school boards associations, both public and Catholic, I met with large city mayors and uh, with AMD and C and, uh, a, and AUMA, the municipally elected officials, and I offered to them an ability to assist us in drafting of the budget. See, what happens right now, Ken, is that government works on a budget starting around July, August. And, and the departments work on the budget, and they finally drop the budget somewhere around March, April. And school boards, and ATA, and municipally of, of the elected officials who actually have to deal with that budget later, they get seconded into our room about two hours prior to the budget being dropped. They get surprised, usually no one likes the budget, and, and, and that's the extent of their involvement. No, we're a province only of four million people. That's hardly a city anywhere else in the world. <laughs> it always behooves you. It may be large, but, but that's the reality. The fact is that the bodies who actually deal with the consequences of the budget, the school boards, ATA, uh, municip municipalities, and, and healthcare, must play a more instrumental, constructive role in the building of the budget to begin with. And that would allow not only for cross-pollination of ideas from ministry to ministry, from, from stakeholder to stakeholder, but would leave us with fewer surprises and perhaps find us an allow us to find opportunities to better spend the dollars that we're currently spending. That has never happened before. We have this uh, ability to surprise everybody and ourselves, usually around March. And, and that is not the way you run a province, that is not the way you collaborate. Because at the end of the day, uh, my perspective has always been that we're all in this together. If you fail, we fail. And, and the fact is, when you deal with education, we simply can't afford to fail. It's, it's the, the Ministry of Education must be working closer with stakeholders and building up the budget moving forward. But I cannot give you a promise that you will get a 5% increase every year um, in, uh, uh, for the rest uh, of, uh, you know, of, of my life because frankly in this province at this point in time no one can make that assurance. But if you're going to do results-based budgeting and you have been working on that as a government, will that continue under your leadership? And if it's going to be results-based, then if you want these results, we have a pretty good idea of what it takes for resources to get there, both human capital, uh, cash, and facilities. That's right. Ken, uh, re result-based budgeting was a great idea, but it was rather superficial up to this point. We frankly need to pride ourselves on reviewing fewer ministries, but actually going in deeper and finding the efficiencies in the ministries and making sure that the dollars actually end up in education case in the classroom. 
Um, you know, that speaks also, uh, I've heard that Mark uh, talking about workload. No, the administrative burden that is being put on principals and teachers right now, a lot of it can definitely be eliminated because you're getting piled on by the principal, by, by school board and, and by the department. You know, this is the kind of review that we can do moving forward that will save us not only dollars but hours uh, in a very valuable uh, teacher's time. Uh, that would be one mechanism of, of transferring dollars. Now, part of the issue that we're facing, not only in education but, uh, but in healthcare, is that uh, we have some of the perennial problems and instead of actually addressing the problems that we're hearing about where uh, where the student meets the teacher, where the patient meets the, meets the healthcare worker, we tend to think around with the corporate structures. Now we're talking about how many uh, health boards we need to have and what kind of a board should be sitting at the top and what the comp comp corporate composition is. But when you actually step back and when you actually listen to frontline workers, it is just amazing what kind of ideas they have and where, can, where they can save you money and give you ideas on how the system can be delivered better, more efficiently, efficiently and actually with better results. So uh, that's how I usually manage my ministries, uh, dealing with frontline workers, and, and I would expect uh, all ministries to do that. And that's part of result-based budget, budgeting. You know, we, we, in the first phase of it, we took a very corporate approach to it from top down. We need to go deeper, we need to go to front lines and see how we can redirect some of the resources. Natalie is a sports teacher from Lethbridge, and she asks, the recent movement back to inclusive classrooms has come alongside to, uh, with cuts to funding for programs such as class size initiatives. The results in some districts has been a reduction in classroom learning assistance and a lack of support for teachers in the classroom. Student numbers in classrooms keep rising, and some classes have up to five special needs students in a single classroom with no learning assistance support. The argument teachers keep hearing is that the government gives funds to the school district and then allows the districts to direct the funds as they see fit. Natalie says this strategy is not working. As Premier, would you be willing to take a stand in setting standards across the province that force the school districts to meet classroom size and composition requirements? No, that is, a, that is a good question. No, I, uh, I've done a lot of work on, on, uh, on, on files that are related to persons with disabilities and, and, and one thing we need to look at immediately is the entire funding formula for a person with a disability. Because there are disabilities that simply never change. We, we know that, uh, that the diagnosis will remain the same and the person will have the disability no matter what age they are. And that they will be dependent on some form of external assistance, uh, no matter whether they're preschool, whether they're in school, or, or in, a, in, a, in employment. And yet funding formulas arbitrarily change based on that person's age. You know, you have PUF funding, uh, which I hear from many parents and, and, and those who are involved in early childhood um, the programming that actually works exceptionally well. And unfortunately, it doesn't carry on the moment child enters a school, as if that child somehow uh, changed and that child's need changed. Them. You know, if it works for Johnny before he enters kindergarten, the odds are it's going to work for him after. And, and just because this, this young person now graduated from grade 12, and moves into the world of employment, we, we sort of drop it. And yet we know that they can be a very productive member of our community, and if you don't focus on the disability, but focus on the abilities and match them with an employer, they can be some of the best employees uh, money can buy. And yet, often, they don't have that kind of support moving forward either. So we need to look at the, we need to look at the part of the funding that actually makes sense and that Albertans are more, most satisfied with, and that's PUF funding. And looking, we have to look at ways of extending it throughout the entire life of the child. The fact is that we know that this child will need this kind of, this kind of level of, of support and, and it is up to us to do it. Um, explain, explain PUF funding. What is that? Well, PUF funding is very much individualized. And, uh, and, and the resources that are afforded to the child uh, are, are greater because of the fact that yes, the dollar allowance is significantly higher, but it is much more flexible uh, funding. But it ends the moment our children enter formal education, and uh, 
And, and we hear very often with parents that, you know, my, my kid was doing so well before he entered school, and now look what happened. <laughs> well, it has nothing to do with the fact that the child entered school. It has to do with the fact that we dropped the child, and, and we no longer support that child the way, we, the way we did prior to the child entering the school system. Uh, it makes us all collectively look pretty bad, but it has nothing to do with uh, what happens in the school. It has to do with, with the funding model. So that gives us a great segue into the teaching profession. Uh, Dave is a math teacher from Edmonton. The provincial contract that was legislated last year was supposed to address teacher workload issues, but instead of actually devoting effort to make such make it work, the minister forgot about it and focused his energy on attacking us. <laughs> we received three zeros and our workload issues aren't getting fixed. When every teacher's contract expires in 2016, 45,000 teachers in Alberta will be without a contract. What priority should there be for the next round of bargaining? And what do you see as a sustainable salary increase? <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's not a two-part question. It's a math It's a math question. It's a math question. Uh, well, first of all, you know, nothing will happen, nothing constructive will happen until we put uh, this acrimonious relationship on ice. And, and, and that will happen uh, if I'm so lucky to, uh, to be uh, the premier with, with the upcoming cabinet shuffle. Uh, we have to start a new relationship. That's all there is to it. And, and, and I will what do you do with Jeff Johnson? <laughs> Maybe I won't have to worry, he's not supporting me. But, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, you know, we, we would waste even more time if we would then point fingers. You know, it, it's time for, for a reset button. Uh, we know it can be done. And, you know, tell me by, by yay or nay, but, but I considered our relationship when I had the privilege of being a Minister of Education to be a good one. Uh, you know, it can always get better. There's always issues that we deal with. But at the end of the day, it is not the issues that come up. Because there will be issues that will come up. You know, we will negotiate wages and, and, and who knows what will happen. But if there is a respectful relationship, when I can pick up a phone and call Mark or vice versa or, or, or go for a, uh, for a private discussion with him, when, when we know that there are no hidden agendas, and when we all agree that at the end of the day we're working for our students in the classroom, we can deal with everything. We can deal with, with anything future throws our way. So I will expect that kind of a relationship to happen between the Minister of Education and ATA. I will make sure that no uh, decisions on policy, on curriculum, uh, on reports are made uh, without consultation with ATA. You know, if, if the world recognizes ATA as a leader, why wouldn't we over here? Yeah. Yeah. And there will be times when we will have to agree to disagree. But the fact is we can do this in a, in a very respectful way. You know, I, I often believe and continue to believe that the process is more important at times than the outcome. When all parties are satisfied that we have arrived at a decision in a way that was fair, inclusive, that everybody was heard and had an opportunity to express their opinions, uh, sometimes either one of us may not like the outcome, uh, but we will be satisfied that at least we got there in, in a fair and orderly way. And, and that is what I, I will be focusing on uh, in our relationship moving forward. Now I can tell you that the most recent contentious report that was dropped, okay. um, I, I had many issues with the matter A, it was drafted, and B, delivered and handled. Are there aspects of that report that we all can agree on? I think so. There are some parts of it. And I would encourage ATA to pick up uh, that report, highlight the parts that you agree with, and start implementing it. But I also think that the parts that we don't agree on it's a good beginning for a respectful conversation. Uh, we can talk about it, uh, we, can, we can debate it, we can discuss it, uh, but you will not see me unilaterally dropping reports on you 
uh, in this format. It's just not the way I operate. It's not the way I ever have. And uh, and I know that this respect uh, will be mutual. I'm, uh, I'm finding this quite interesting. Because I've, I've come in at the last minute, and, and Jonathan is ultimately a teacher in his heart, too. He's given me some questions, and most importantly is uh, to make sure the questions that were submitted by members get get addressed by you. And so I've been focusing on those questions. Uh, if I understand correctly, Jonathan, that in, that in, if I understand you correctly, too, you were giving these questions in advance. You know what? I, I don't, let me finish I, this point. <laughs> <laughs> let me finish this point. Because I asked, I asked, I asked uh, Thomas just before we started uh, that you've had a chance to review the questions. He says, yeah, but I didn't. I, I, I intend to keep my, I would rather keep my answers fresh uh, and in the moment. And um, and what's interesting is your answers give me segues and answer the next question that's coming up. <laughs> Either you are simpatico or you like me but not answer. Would I lie to you? I'm a politician. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> anybody, anybody wants to buy a car? <laughs> no, anybody want to buy a used car? Yeah. <laughs> the, you know, the way, the way, the way I always deal with interviews and and question period is is I always ask not to be told what the questions are because uh, it, it just comes off very reversed. And, and I always said to myself and, and to many of my more rookie colleagues that if you can't stand up in a house and answer the question that opposition asks you or frankly, your own members from behind you ask you, then you shouldn't be a minister in the first place. So I always prided myself on, on doing my homework, reading the files, so that I can answer your questions. But if you, know, if you, give, me, if you give me questions, then uh, I don't think we would be as entertaining as we are right now. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to paraphrase John's question. He's, from, he's a middle school teacher from Camrose and asked about the difficult time accepting the Johnson and Post contract. Uh, but he also goes to what some, uh, his question is framed around what you've been talking about earlier in the conversation and some dialogue and not dropping reports on the profession. But I want to take his question here and drive a little bit deeper on it because uh, I think you're ready for this. Uh, how, would you, as, how would you, as Premier, build a positive, lasting relationship with Alberta teachers? Positive and lasting. And reestablish trust. We talked about conversation. We've done positive and look at lasting. What I want to get into: How would you reestablish trust between this profession and our government? Well, you know, I've spoken to that because, uh, as you can imagine, trust is, is a is a theme that sort of is weaving itself through this leadership race. I wouldn't call it weaving. I think it is tsunami. <laughs> Be it as it may, <laughs> I, I firmly believe that trust is not something that can be bestowed on somebody else. Now, you, you, there's arguments that if we have somebody come in to the, to the chair of the premier from the outside, somehow all of a sudden that person's credibility will, will be shared among everybody else in cabinet and caucus. And I say, that's not the way trust works. Trust has to be earned. And I know that we have until 2016 to earn that trust back from you, from parents, from all of Albertans. And the way you earn trust is, is by behaving and acting in a manner uh, that, that warrants so. So what I will be asking you is to give me an opportunity to earn your trust back. And then you get to issue your report card in 2016 when, uh, when the next general election comes up. I know that, that I can put together a team of cabinet ministers, a much smaller team than we have right now, of cabinet ministers who are committed to delivering on what it is that I'm hearing from, uh, from Albertans right now. And Ken, what am I hearing about? Yes, I'm hearing a lot about diversifying the economy and growing economy and pipelines and all that is important. That's a given. That has to happen. But I'm also hearing about the fact that we have kids where we don't have schools and we have schools where we don't have kids. I'm hearing about the fact that we have elderly people in hospitals as opposed to in senior homes. I'm hearing about the fact that 
you know, as funny as it may seem to some, but it isn't funny to those families that right now families sign up for daycare space before they have even conceived. Because the waiting space is up to three years in some municipalities. And, well, that's right. But you know, not everybody's got <laughs> We, we, a, a lot of our, a lot of our, a lot of our infrastructure is deteriorating and hasn't been maintained. No, those are the issues that I'm hearing about from Albertans. And if we purposely plan to deliver on those commitments, if we bring our relationship uh, to a level where we can, where we can be in the same room and focus on children and focus on the classroom. If we actually fix some of those perennial issues in healthcare as opposed to playing around with the corporate structure of Alberta Health Services, I firmly believe that Albertans will look at our track record of the past, not just the last year, but of the past, and, and will give us uh, uh, the privilege of, of being in government uh, following 2016. But that will be up to you to decide, and that would be up to me to prove to you over a rather short period of time. So let's move on to some other issues. Um, Dan is a substitute teacher from Calgary and he asks, leaders and governments come to power by flying the banner of no new taxes and rely on energy royalties to pay for priorities like education and health care. You've touched on this earlier. But royalties fluctuate and as a result priority areas like education and health receive unpredictable funding. As Premier, what changes would you make to ensure, one, that priority areas receive predictable funding, and two, that royalties can be invested in ways that improve the future of Alberta rather than paying for its day-to-day -day operations? We have between, on a good year, 15% of general revenues coming from non-renewable resource world revenues, and a bad year, 50%, right? It seems to me that that is stealing from other generations when we're starting using non-renewable resources like that for our general operating, is in no new taxes. What would you do about the tax situation? You've answered the predictable funding question in part, and I'm not suggesting you don't do it again, but I'm interested in how you see the use of royalties and resource revenues um, as, as how they be invested. Well, number one, Ken, we have to look at how we spend the money we, we already have. And, and I've been very firm on the fact that our operating budget must be balanced. You know, families don't borrow money or shouldn't be borrowing money to buy groceries. But we all borrow money to buy a house. Now, we don't live in a tent for as long as it takes us to save money to buy a house and then buy a house. We, we mortgage and we amortize the cost of that house over 20, 30, whatever, how many years your mortgage is. And as long as that house is worth more than your mortgage, you're not really in debt. You have an asset that outweighs outweighs your liability. Businesses do this. As a matter of fact, even when they have money on hand, they don't spend their cash. They amortize. And with the AAA credit rating that we have in this province, it simply would not make sense for us to do it. And I know that there are those who are very ideologically driven. And they say, no, no matter what, you cannot do that. The fact is, we must do that. We have fallen behind in our infrastructure. And a lot of the money that we're spending right now out of our operating budget we don't actually need to spend on infrastructure. We should be amortizing our infrastructure for a period of time. The school we build today is not just going to serve our children today. If we build it right, it will actually serve children for the next 100 years. There is nothing wrong with amortizing that cost over 20 or 30. That itself would liberate a lot of cash, cash flow, to be able to address some of our operating deficiencies that we have right now. You know, this province, from a royalty perspective, is very low, volatile, and we have seen what happens when you try to tinker around with, with royalties, and, and you, nobody would know better than you, uh, coming from, uh, from Fort McMurray. And it's not the oil companies. A lot of people often say, you know, well, where will they go? The oil is here. They're staying here no matter what. The oil companies will, but the investment that actually allows them to extract that oil comes from, from uh, financial houses all over the world, New York, uh, Paris, and other places, and they will invest in other commodities. That money flows back and forth, and we've seen some of it when Premier Stelmark tried to uh, tinker around with royalties. Taxation in this province is still a four-letter word. 
but we need to have a conversation. You know, uh, uh, we've seen a, a trend uh, from time to time here and, and in other jurisdictions when government comes to you and say, you have a problem and I'm here to fix it for you, uh, before you actually realize that, that you actually do have a problem. That is not the way governments are to operate. Uh, we, we, we should be engaging in a robust discussion with Albertans, all of us, on what our tax structure should look like moving forward. Uh, but in the meantime, that will take time. Will that, get, before that we get to that point, will that, discussion on, will that discussion on tax structure include a return to a progressive tax, and or will it include a possibility of consumption tax? You know, I'm always open to any discussion. I've always said that, and you probably heard, heard me say it, that when you're in government, no topic should be taboo. Anything is up to you for discussion. But our principal issue in Alberta is not how we calculate the tax. It's what we calculate the tax off of. And the base off of which we calculate our tax fluctuates up and down with the price of a, of a barrel of oil. That's why a long-term solution in this province, and we talk about it a lot, but every time oil hits $100 a barrel, we say, ah, never mind, we go back on the gravy train. <laughs> The real solution is to actually put our minds together and work with other industries and with our post-secondary institutions and evolve new economic activities in this province that are not based on oil and gas. So, and, and I know that agriculture and, and research uh, could be part of that answer. We're just about out of time, Thomas, and uh, I want to get one more question. Isn't it? You can give me the segue. Mm -hmm. Natalie is a learning support teacher from Lethbridge. She asked, the federal government has systemically removed environmental protections from parks, forests, and waterways to allow gas and oil companies to mine our natural resources. This has led to the destruction of many of our pristine wilderness places and the loss of habitat for millions of plants and animal species in the country. I'd like to talk to Natalie about that. Um, <laughs> as a provincial leader, what would, to what extent would you be willing to stand up to the oil companies and the federal government to preserve the environment? Good question. Well, this is where I probably differ the most uh, from uh, some, some, at least some of the colleagues that are running against me. I firmly believe that if we are to have the social license, and that's, that's a grossly overused term, but that's the only one I can think of, the confidence of our consumers to continue to extract our oil and gas, even in larger quantities, and then find new markets and export it to different countries, we have to convince the world that we are good stewards of our environment. And to do so, and this is where the difference, differences come in, number one, I firmly believe that we have to carry on with the carbon levy that we have right now. Would you increase it? Yes, I would to enter into discussions with oil companies to increase it because that discussion has already begun and I think they're ready for that. They're ready for that. And the reason I feel so firmly about that is number one, those are dollars that stay in Alberta and are invested in research, in education, that are then leveraged against dollars from all over the world. Because there's no reason why this province should not be the center of excellence on technologies in, in environmental protection and stewardship of environment, and pipeline construction and pipe, pipeline maintenance and then monitoring. That is the fund that we should be utilizing to do so. Second one is carbon capture and storage. You know, I don't care uh, what some individuals who are, again, driven by an ideology will tell you that this is a science experiment. It isn't. The fact is that this is carbon that we're not emitting into, at, into our atmosphere. We're storing it. And companies like Shell, not Shell Canada, but the mothership of Shell Canada back home, <laughs> back home in Holland are showing us that actually they're using now this, this, this carbon that they stored as a feedstock for greenhouse operations. They're getting into agriculture. And I know that we will find uses for, for carbon uh, as a feedstock for other industries. We're doing but, that in Fort McMurray right now. That's right. But most importantly, Ken, the fact is this. If we don't carry on with those two initiatives and we, we take the lead of, uh, of some other candidates, we will not meet our self-imposed environmental targets. Imagine going to the world and saying, please buy our product when we don't meet our own environmental targets. We can't afford to do that. And lastly, I guess where I differ significantly is I am firmly of the belief 
that in a province like ours, where our livelihood to a large extent depends on extraction of carbon fuels, and where we live, we live in this province, this is our environment, we cannot allow neither Ottawa nor Washington, in particular Washington, to be setting our environmental targets. This is our environment, we must be in charge of setting our environmental targets because it will be our children that will be living in this province into the future. So, Thomas, we're just, we're just about out of time. In fact, we're a little bit over time. But Can I have the other two candidates time? <laughs> you may not have noticed you did. Oh. <laughs> um, Closing remarks, a couple, three minutes. Uh, you're, in a, you're in a campaign. You've talked a lot about policy. You've talked about policy that's relevant to this audience at their request. Um, what's your message to them at your request? What's your ask of them? Well, thank you. Well, first of all, I would ask you to, to take a minute uh, when, when you have one to, to get on my website and, and look at the platform. Uh, address is easy, votethomas.ca. And, and ask yourself this fundamental question. Uh, whom do you want your Premier to be for the next two years? I appreciate the fact, however wrong that is, that all of you don't support the PC party. <laughs> but at this point in time, this is not an election between different political parties. This is a leadership race within one party, but this leadership race will result in one of the three of us becoming a Premier. I think there is a lot of work to be done. The last year was not very constructive. I think we can reset the button and do some great work together. I always enjoyed in the past in different capacities uh, working with your president, with Mark, and I'm looking forward to that into the future. I would strongly encourage you to purchase a PC party membership. I'm sorry, my campaign doesn't give them out for free. You have to buy one. You can, you can buy them on the website or actually we have a little booth set up in the back. And, and make that decision because the office of the Premier really shapes uh, the future of our province and the face of government. Premiers pick their own cabinets. Premiers give each man minister a mandate letter telling them you will do this but you won't do that. And premiers uh, will shuffle the cabinet when their wishes are not uh, uh, being adhered to. It's a big decision and we have this rare opportunity to vote directly for our premier. Uh, I would encourage you to, uh, to consider it. You know that I am a firm uh, believer in public education. I've been on the record saying that I will not, I will not increase funding to, pub to private education. I've been, uh, my children are students in, uh, in, in public education and you know I had the privilege, though not for very long, uh, to be a teacher myself. I, uh, I would look forward to working with you, but that choice is yours. Thank, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you for your time.